This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 967, recorded on December 22nd, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to have you back because it was too noisy in Uganda. <laughs> it, it was hard, um, <laughs> I have to say. You know, like that that first night, like out there in the storm and trying to use my iPhone. And, and then that, that, you know, the couple <laughs> other times when I was recording, like up in the mountains on the DRC border, what, like a few kilometers away from where the ISIS insurgents came across the line. I mean, it was just... Uh, well... Yeah, <laughs> people do appreciate that you do this remotely. And I think we couldn't have done this five years ago, probably. The tech wasn't there. So it's really remarkable that uh, that we can do this. So anytime you, it's fine, we can try it always because people need to keep up with their clinical information. Yeah, I think Lori Garrett and I were chatting when there was that... Um event at the incubator about one time she had some satellite uplink and, you know, just, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, things have gotten a little bit easier. So I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't yep. complain. I'll, I'll just die of malaria. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, but all right, let me get right into it. No one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. And that's Charles Dickens. And it, it seems to me that quoting Dixon's works with uh, so many celebrating um, Christmas throughout the world. So uh, this will drop, I guess, on Christmas Eve. So um, uh, Merry Christmas to those of you celebrating. And actually, it's uh, we are in the middle of uh, Hanukkah, actually. So for the youngest who listen, I think we have some very young listeners. Remember, it's not like your birthday. Don't blow out the candles. All right. Um, let me start with uh, an article. Immunological dysfunction persists for eight months following initial mild to moderate SARS-CoV-2 infection published in Nature Immunology. I have to say, when I saw this title, I was like, oh, this, this may answer many questions. Well, maybe not. So this is a study where the title can be, I think, misleading. The investigators studied individuals with long COVID compared to age and gender matched recovered individuals without long COVID, unexposed donors, and individuals infected with other coronaviruses. The, apparently, they're discussing calling them the common coronaviruses, which I think we already do. Anyway, patients with long COVID have highly activated innate immune cells, lacked naive T and B cells, and showed elevated expression of type 1 interferon, interferon beta, uh, type 3 interferon, interferon lambda 1, that remain persistently high at eight months after infection. Uh, they report that they analyzed a cohort of individuals followed systematically for eight months after COVID-19 infection, according to a predefined schedule, compared them to healthy donors unexposed to SARS-CoV-2, uh, the unexposed healthy controls before December 2019, and individuals who had been infected with prevalent common cold human coronaviruses, um, but not SARS-CoV-2. Um, they, they assessed 28 analytes in the serum, um, looked at matched controls, um, unexposed healthy individuals. Uh, they did report that six pro-inflammatory cytokines um, and soluble T-cell immunoglobulin mucin domain 3 were elevated in the um, long COVID um, and compared these to the other groups. Um, but I have to say, I don't think this data really gives us that compelling data that COVID immune dysfunction following infection explains this onslaught of respiratory viral infections we're suffering through. Um, I did also get some communications. Um, you know, we, we talked about Sweden um, suggesting that there may have been um, more significant voluntary behavior changes than suggested. So I'm um, still leaving a lot open to explain why are we getting um, such a deluge of uh, respiratory issues. And along those lines, influenza has taken over. Um, but we are now, I hope, reinforcing that. Occam was not a physician, and a patient can have as many diseases as they darn well please. So the MMWR release 
prevalence of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza co-infection and clinical characteristics among children and adolescents aged less than 18 years who were hospitalized or died with influenza United States 2021 through 2022 influenza season. Um, really reinforces um, this saying, um, and they report that during the 2021-2022 influenza season, 6%, so a little bit more than 1 in 20, hospitalized pediatric influenza patients had SARS-CoV-2 co-infection. A higher percentage of patients with co-infection required invasive or non-invasive respiratory support compared with those with influenza only. So among the influenza-associated Pediatric deaths, yes, pediatric deaths, 16% had SARS-CoV-2 co-infection. Also, a higher proportion of patients with co-infection um, received mechanical ventilation. That was 13% versus 4. Um, BiPAP or CPAP, 16% versus 6. Um, 44 influenza-associated pediatric deaths were reported uh, to the influenza-associated pediatric mortality surveillance system. 16% um, of um, you know, these folks, SARS-CoV-2 co-infection. So were these flu deaths? Are they COVID deaths? Are they fluorona deaths? But um, their deaths, they are children um, that didn't survive. Um, continuing to see is sort of a warning to those who are, um, you know, getting together. That's what human beings do, um, that we are seeing um, incredibly high influenza activity um, across the country. So you know, I think it was joking with um, Brian Lair about, um, you know, being judgy about people getting together with wanton abandon. I mean, people get together during the holidays. So um, just, you know, a little bit more education, a little bit more information um, so people can make wise decisions. Um, just a little primer here on influenza. We have really um, covered COVID in depth. Um, but people will be listening over the Christmas weekend. Um, first transmission, big thing here is respiratory, but also contact. So wash those hands. I know everyone loves to hug. Um, incubation period. The typical incubation period is, is, is pretty short, one to four days. Average is about two days. Um, clinical presentation, um, it's a virus. So it presents like a, well, an influenza-like illness. <laughs> but it actually is influenza. <laughs> so fever, malaise, cough, body aches. Um, and how do you diagnose it? If you don't do a test, you don't, you don't know. Um, you know, this is going to be PCR. It's going to be antigen testing um, and actually treatment. We do have some options. Um, so again, think about what we've talked about with, um, with COVID. Um, think about really identifying those people who are going to benefit um, starting the Tamiflu, the us. Ocel Tamavir within the first 48 hours of symptom onset. And, and I will I will say, and I'll talk a little bit more about this next week as well. We are running short um, of medication for influenza. We actually, um, the, the US government is gonna release extra doses from our strategic um, stockpile. Um, so this is something that, you know, listen, if it's if it's a low risk individual, they're gonna feel better, you know, a day sooner. Um, let's make wise decisions about who who benefits most. So if you've got an older individual, grandma, grandpa, um, people that look like Dixon with that white beard, you know, if it's Santa coming to town, he carries a little bit of extra weight, um, he would be that that target population for the, the Tamiflu. Why are we running out of antivirals? We haven't got enough stockpiled? It's kind of interesting, isn't it, that we're running out of, uh, yeah. It, well, this is, I have to say, this is the worst influenza season um, in mm. over a decade when it comes to hospitalization. So this is really, um, this is really um, hitting the system hard. Okay, so more people are needing the antivirals, so our normal supply is is inadequate. Basically. Exactly, exactly. All right, yeah. All right, and COVID um, is it too soon? Perhaps uh, you know people talk about how many people died during the nineteen eighteen flu pandemic, um, and the estimates are so broad. Uh, perhaps in part because um, you know when do we stop counting? When is a death part of the pandemic? When is a you know when did that pandemic of nineteen eighteen actually end? But the article, the WHO estimates of excess mortality associated with the COVID nineteen pandemic was published in Nature. Um, 
should they, they add at the end of the title so far? Um, here they are reporting excess mortality, which they define as the difference in the total number of deaths in a crisis compared to those expected under normal conditions. And they report an estimated um, 4.47 million excess deaths for India alone um, during the period of January 2020 to December 2021, right? That's, you know, stopped about a year ago, um, followed by one over one million um, excess deaths in the Russian Federation, um, over one million excess deaths in Indonesia, um, close to a million excess deaths in the United States. So in, in total, about 15 million excess deaths globally just during that period of time. Um, and remember, this is excess. So the total number of COVID-19 deaths is actually higher. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, so far because the deaths are continuing. Um, I have to say, I'm always kind of, um, you know, curious when I watch these comments on, on Twitter where people seem not to want to count um, COVID deaths. So sort of interesting. But also right up front here, I want to discuss the article, Reconsideration of Anti-Nuclear Capsid IgG Antibody as a Marker of SARS-CoV-2 Infection Post-Vaccination for Mild COVID-19 Patients Published in Open Form Infectious Disease. Is Rich Condit listening? Um, Rich, I'm going to so. send this to you. Um, 82 <laughs> adult participants who, one, were enrolled in the outpatient SARS-CoV-2 mild and asymptomatic immune response and transmission outsmart cohort after 2020-12-09, two, had confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection by nasopharyngeal saliva RNA test. Three were greater than equal to 18 years old. And four had at least one validated oral plasma antibody result. And five had mild COVID-19 with a reported date of symptom onset. They found that while patients who were infected prior to vaccination, who were never vaccinated, maintained elevated anti-NIgG antibody responses, those who were vaccinated prior to infection had significantly lower anti-NIgG responses. Nice p-value there. Um, mild COVID-19 patients, those with prior vaccination, do not reliably induce robust anti-NIgG responses in plasma or oral fluid. Hence, the use of anti-N antibody responses as a surrogate for recent infection may not be reliable for COVID-19 surveillance. It's very interesting that, uh, you know, vaccination is obviously reducing the amount of virus replication. So you're not getting a good response to the nuclear capsule, which is the most abundant viral protein. I think it's fascinating, right? I mean, and I, I've been listening to Immune and, and I'll give a plug for that several times as we go forward. But, you know, is this an example of that, that immune imprinting, um, that original antigenic sin, what I call the butterfly effect, um, where, you know, this should be the immunodominant um, response. You should be well, targeting imprinting is not even relevant because it's the, it's a conserved protein it doesn't change in the in the in the variants whatsoever um not significantly so i yeah. don't know why the only thing i can think of is that if you're vaccinated you're getting so much less reproduction that uh, you don't get a good antibody but any anyway daniel what can you use for surveillance then because you need to use a serological test because pcr is too transient right yeah no this is this is hard yeah because is this that you're just not getting enough response to get anti-n or in my mind are you putting all your response towards the s because that's what you saw before oh that's what you meant yeah. by imprinting okay yeah, the imprinting um but yeah, this is interesting because we want to do serology, right? We want to know what's yeah. going on in prevalence and can you do it post-vaccine? And and I think all of us thought, oh, this is great. This will be like hepatitis, what we do there. We look at some um, – it may be over time, right? So I, I had a um, pediatrician I take care of up in, um, up in Maine who um, with his first vaccine um, developed transverse myelitis, very temporal, so concerns there. I um, mean, he's all worried, you know, what, what will happen now that we don't have Ebby shelled? What will happen, you know, COVID's here to stay? Um, you know, and my hope is as we got farther and farther out, you know, will he end up with a good anti-N antibody response? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think this is a challenge. Um, the other article right up front here, Impact of SARS-CoV-2 Variants on Inpatient Clinical Outcomes, published in CID. And I'm always trying to get information on how much of the progress 
we are seeing is due to the virus changing versus the protection that our immune system provides from vaccination or surviving a prior infection. Um, so here we get a look at data from high, five hospitals in the eastern United States with stratification by history of prior vaccination or infection. They found that the risk for severe disease or death from Omicron patients um, compared to ancestral lineages was 0.94 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.78 to 1.1. So among Omicron and Delta infections, patients with history of vaccination or prior SARS-CoV-2 infection had half the risk of severe disease or death, but no significant outcome difference by variant. So, um, the risk of severe disease or death for unvaccinated patients with Omicron was similar to ancestral lineages. Severe outcomes were less common in vaccinated inpatients with no difference between Delta and Omicron infections. How often, Daniel, did we hear about Omicron as a cold? And, you know, yeah. this is the problem with making conclusions the first few weeks that a variant emerges by observation of hospitalization. Now you do the right studies and you find that they're all, it just, it's crazy, isn't it? You know, and it's one of those things that, you know, it's frustrating, Vincent, because, you know, we're, we're going to see um, in China, right? Unfortunately, in China, there's not mm -hmm. a lot of um, um, immunity from prior infection. There's unfortunately not a lot of immunity from vaccination in the, the highest risk populations. So as right. we've heard, the older individuals in mainland China are too frail to be vaccinated. Um, so unfortunately, what we're seeing here is that, no, no, the virus did not become um, mild. Uh, what we're seeing is vaccines work. Um, and so a vaccinated individual that gets infected with a virulent virus does a lot better than someone who doesn't have immunity. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I worry about that common wisdom, this idea that, oh, Omicron has become, the virus has become so mild um, that now it's just a head cold. No, what makes COVID mild is um, our immune system. All right, so that's the science. All right, children, COVID, and other vulnerable populations. Um, and I'm gonna change, I'm gonna say, children are at risk from COVID and long COVID. So the article, Clinical Features and Burden of Post-Acute Sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 Infection in Children and Adolescents was published in Open Forum Infectious Disease. In brief, they looked, um, at, uh, it was a retrospective cohort study using electronic health records from nine U.S. children's hospitals uh, for individuals less than 21 years of age who underwent PCR testing for SARS-CoV-2 between March 1, 2020 and October 31, 2021, and had at least one encounter in the three years before testing. And the reason they do that is so you have a baseline. Um, they identified 659,286 children and... 59,893 that tested positive by PCR for SARS-CoV-2. They reported an incident proportion difference, so the sort of the excess of 3.8%. Um, so a higher strength of association for PASC was identified in those cared for in the ICU during the acute illness phase, children less than five, individuals with complex chronic conditions. So um, a few, I think, important points. Um, so they're reporting PASC features in the 28 to 179 days following the initial test date. So there is an issue um, with the definition of PASC, how much of this resolves at 90 days or 12 weeks. But really just a reminder, and this is something that was brought up in a recent discussion I had with, with a mom um, about, you know, why, why would we consider vaccinating her young children? And it's that children are at risk from COVID and long COVID. Pre-exposure period, transmission and testing. Um, use those tests intelligently. Remember this more out there than just COVID and have a plan. So I was giving a talk for a major health system in New York that shall remain um, unnamed. And when I talked, <laughs> <laughs> I talked about how we should just do the anterior nares instead of those deep brain biopsies, particularly in the children. I was told that the practice was still to do the deep swabs in the children. I suggested that rather than changing my talk, they should change their practice. Apparently that was too challenging at the time, but perhaps the article, similar SARS-CoV-2 CT value distributions in anterior nares versus nasopharyngeal samples from symptomatic children during Delta and Omicron surges published in JPIDs is perhaps enough to move the needle. All there in the title for the surgeons and a great figure for the PhDs. 
Daniel, if yes. people are still giving antibiotics for COVID, this is not going to change the needle. I'm sorry. <laughs> They're going to keep sticking it all the way in there because that's what I learned to do in April of 2020. I can't move forward. All right. Uh, I also want to say that there was a nice article by my friend, Karen Weintraub. I think we're friends at USA Today, alerting people to the fact that the White House has a plan. And this includes, are you ready? This is going to solve everything. Offering Americans four more free coronavirus tests per household. <laughs> <laughs> Collaborating with communities to open pop-up or mobile vaccination sites pre-positioning critical supplies like masks, gloves, and gowns from the strategic national stockpile, providing more support to nursing homes and long-term care facilities to protect the most vulnerable. Well, interesting. So only four free coronavirus tests. So that's one for me, one for my wife, one for Daisy, one for Eloise. Oh, sorry, Barnaby. <laughs> I shouldn't have had that third child. That will teach people not to have more than two children. And what about those other things? What support are they going to offer to nursing homes and long-term care facilities? Maybe some salary support so they can adequately staff the facilities with high quality staff. All right. Masks, lots of concerns with the quality of studies, but in general, the science favors mask use and suggests a hierarchy with N95s offering the highest level of protection. If you're feeling sick and you must go to that holiday gathering, consider wearing a mask. If you're high risk, consider wearing a mask. Um, actually, here in New York, I am seeing um, a little bit more mask use coming back. So, you know, you, you don't need a mandate. It doesn't need to be required. You can actually be educated and make a smart decision. Um, ventilation, transmission, just reinforcing for the holidays that this is almost exclusively respiratory spread. So keep that HVAC fan turned to on open a few windows, wear a sweater if, it, if it's a little chilly, and remember how much safer outdoors is from indoors. I'm a little worried about this, what is it, a um, Arctic or polar vortex or something that's coming our way. So everyone will be crammed in together, breathing, um, you know, poor quality infected air. So um, winter, that's what happens, right, Daniel? <laughs> yes, yes, it's what happens. So COVID active vaccination. Um, Lots to talk about this week with two MMWRs. <laughs> um, let me present, uh, we'll, we'll talk about these. So let's, let's bring them up and then we'll have a little discussion. So let me present the reports um, so we can discuss how to interpret the data. So first, early estimates of, and very early estimates of bivalent mRNA vaccine effectiveness in preventing COVID-19 associated emergency department or urgent care encounters and hospitalizations among immunocompetent adults, Vision Network, nine states, September-November 2022. So this is more data from the Vision Network where the effectiveness of bivalent booster doses among immunocompetent adults during September 13 through November 18, 2022, a period during which the Omicron BA.5 sublineage predominated was analyzed. So vaccine effectiveness in preventing COVID-19 associated emergency department or urgent care encounters and hospitalizations of a bivalent booster dose after two, three, or four monovalent doses against hospitalization for COVID-19 associated illnesses was reported at 57 percent compared with no vaccination and 45 percent compared with receipt of last monovalent doses um, with last dose greater than or equal to 11 months earlier. I um, want to point out among the adults who received a bivalent booster dose, the median interval since receipt of the bivalent booster dose was 23 days. Um, remember, you don't start counting until it's been like, you know, and then you only count to 23. Second MMWR. So you really got a narrow window there to get infected. But second MMWR release, early estimates of bivalent mRNA vaccine effectiveness in preventing COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among immunocompetent adults aged greater than or equal to 65 years, the IV Network 18 states, September 8. Dash November 30, 2022, um, gives us data from the IV um, network. And here we get a report on the effectiveness of a bivalent booster dose received after greater than or equal to two doses of monovalent mRNA vaccine against COVID-19 associated hospitalizations among immunocompetent adults aged greater than or equal to 65. So this is a test negative design 
case control analysis of adults aged 65 or over um, admitted for COVID-19-like illness to any of 22 hospitals in 18 states participating in the Investigating Respiratory Viruses, IV, in the Acutely Ill Network. Here, um, again, the mean interval between receipt of a bivalent booster dose and illness was short at 29 days, interquartile range of 15 to 45. They report that when compared with patients whose last monovalent dose was 6 to 11 months and greater than 12 months before illness onset, relative vaccine effectiveness of a bivalent booster dose was 78% and 83%. Small sample size precluded estimation of the relative vaccine effectiveness of a bivalent booster dose compared with receipt of greater than or equal to two monovalent only mRNA vaccine doses with last dose two to five months before illness onset. All right. So, so let me just make a few comments quickly. I will, because this is your show. <laughs> no, no, I want you to make a few comments. I think this is important for us to discuss. So, And I know Paul this, Offit weighed in a little, so you can even channel him. Yeah, I, I, I emailed Paul and, and asked for his thoughts and he, he agrees. So the problem with this study is that there are multiple problems. First of all, the hospitalization. Paul agrees that you go in either with or because of COVID. It's not clear that we're distinguishing here, and that's a big deal. So hospitalization is not a great metric. They're comparing uh, bivalent with historical monovalent old vaccine, old booster, right? They didn't do an experiment where you give some people bivalent and some people the old booster. If they did that, I think they would be the same. But there's no way to know that because they didn't do that experiment. You can't give people a booster, which is the original booster anymore. So the reason I think it's important is because if you could show that the old booster did the same thing as this one, you wouldn't have to keep making new boosters every time a variant mm -hmm. came around, right? And I think those are important data to have. And then finally, the last issue, these are 29 days from getting this bi bivalent Booster, of course your antibody levels are high. Of course you're going to reduce everything. But in two months or three months, that's going to be gone. So in my opinion, this doesn't say anything positive about the bivalent boosters. Uh, they're just, uh, and as they say, it's a very early analysis. But boy, they shouldn't have made headlines out of this. That's not fair. Yeah, I think I understand why they made headlines. And, you know, uh, the the point you make, I think, you know, you and I, same page here. So so one is this is not unexpected that if you give someone a, a booster for a period of time, you're going to have some degree of protection. Yeah. And, and we've talked about that. We've said, like, let, let's not overpromise, though. Are we talking about 21 days of protection, you know, that we're counting because we don't count for the first seven and then we count for 21, um, it, you know. I, there's a political agenda, right? We sure. we want people um, to get um, boosted. We we certainly want um, higher risk individuals to get boosted. Um, but there's a couple questions here. One is, you know, it, this is not a study that says bivalent boosters are better than just getting boosted with the original. And I think that's okay. really important. And actually, we really need the science on that. Um, the other is this was done when BA.5 was was dominant. So what are we going to see now that we're moving into um, mm -hmm. other other variants? Um, and I think this gets a little sophisticated, too. And, I, and John Muscol and I were emailing a little bit as well. So, you know, one of the concerns we have is, OK, now that, um, you know, when you get that booster, is it just boosting neutralizing antibodies? Is it boosting all antibodies? Is it boosting the rest of the immune system? Um, and I think a lot of this stuff, um, you know, we need to, um, we, need, we need that information. That information is going to help us make good decisions in the future. Um, you know, what are these boosters actually boosting? What are they boosting that really matters? Um, and I liked a couple of the recent, you know, well, I really like Immune, by the way. That's my favorite um, podcast we do, even though I'm not on it. Um, but I liked Immune 62. Every cell is an immune cell. Um, with uh, Dabrowski Herbert, where there's really a deeper dive into the complexities of the immune system. And I've been emailing a bit with John Mascola, who was on TWIV 858 that I listened to while I was in West Africa. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to quote 
For a more general talk, for example, to medical residents, I sometimes use the analogy to an orchestra. The strings, woodwinds, brass, and percussion can each make unique contributions and are pleasant to hear on their own, but together they take the listening experience to a new level. Immunity works best when the immune system can call upon more than one component. Um, and also, uh, I was listening to the most recent Immune, um, and I, I emailed John Muscow. I was like, did you email Vincent too? <laughs> did you tell him we should talk? Um, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I love that people listen to this update, but also I'm going to recommend people listen to Immune as well. Just to point out, the immune system is so much more than, you know, getting a serology level, getting your antibody, your spike protein levels, much more than just looking at neutralizing antibodies. Um, I'll carry John. John Muscola's, you know, um, analogy to a higher level. It's like looking at the orchestra and you notice one of the flute players is missing, but all the other flute players are still there and the horns mm -hmm. are still there and the strings are still there. Um, so I think, you know, sometimes we look at just levels of neutralizing antibodies. We forget about all the other um, FC mediated other efficacies of our antibodies. We forget about the rest of the immune system. So you know, what do I take away from this? Um, I'm not sure I can make much of this. Um, yeah, there is going to be some period of time when you're going to get enhanced protection. I, I would expect that. Um, will this enhanced protection work as the variants changed? Um, we will see. That will be interesting. How long will this protection last? But I guess the other, which is really that challenge, is we need a better metric because, you know, it, it's not just the COVID deniers that are having issues with using hospitalization as a metric. I think we're all having an issue with using that as a metric. We need, we need codes that tell us. Is this person being admitted with COVID? Are they getting admitted for COVID? Are they getting admitted for COVID with um, hypoxemia, requiring oxygen? Um, I think we need more information to, to sort this going forward. All right. We also learned that the FDA will again, <laughs> its independent advisors meet January 26th to discuss if the boosters need another update. Oh, my Lord. Unless we want to lose ground going forward, we need to prioritize vaccine education, right? I um, mean, hopefully we're, we're helping with that. Um, but this really means that we need more resources put into communication, not some afterthought. And, um, you know, those, those folks that have been following um, Peter Hotez's efforts for several years now, uh, may be aware that there is an organized, well-funded anti-science movement that is making a fortune of undermining vaccines and selling snake oil. Um, they have really made progress, unfortunately, during the pandemic. So the, the Kaiser Family Foundation COVID-19 Vaccine Monitor Survey in December 2022 found that 71% say healthy children should be required to get vaccinated for MMWR in order to attend public schools down from 82%. So we lost 11% there. Um, almost three in 10, 28% now say that parents should be able to decide not to vaccinate their school age children, even if this creates health risks for others, up from 16%. Um, among Republicans and Republican-leaning independents, there has been a 24 percentage point increase in the share who hold this view from 20 up to 44%. Painful here. We, we are losing the battle, by the way. Um, okay, let's move forward to the COVID early viral upper respiratory non hypoxic phase. More data on Paxlovid works and Paxlovid rebound is not a thing. Um, the article effect of Nermatrelvir Ritonavir versus placebo on COVID-19 related hospitalizations and other medical visits published in open forum infectious disease. These are the results of a phase two, three double blind intervention study. Adults with confirmed SARS-CoV-2 and symptom onset less than or equal to five days were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive, I'm just gonna say Paxlovid or placebo orally every 12 hours for five days. COVID-19 related medical visits were collected through day 28 oxygen support for COVID-19 and details of COVID-19 related hospitalization, including duration, ICU status, and mechanical ventilation were assessed. Of the over 2,000 patients enrolled globally, fewer overall COVID-19 related medical visits were reported um, with Paxlovid versus placebo. In addition, I think it's really important to fewer hospitalizations being reported um, this is 0.8% versus 6.2, so an 87% reduction. Um, patients receiving Paxlovid, the mean duration of days in hospital 
was 9.6 versus 11.2, so about two days shorter. And this is where it really gets important. No patients in the Paxlovid were admitted to the ICU. No patients who received Paxlovid required mechanical ventilation, um, and fewer patients required oxygen at all in the um, Paxlovid treated group versus placebo. So less than 1% versus about 5%. Um, so not only does it keep you out of the hospital, but if you do end up progressing, um, it's really going to protect you from ending up on a ventilator. All right. Number two, remdesivir. Remember the early three-day therapy? Currently, nothing in the monoclonal box. Number four, molnupiravir. I'm going to say last and least, but maybe not because convalescent plasma. I have not talked about convalescent plasma in a while. Um, so again, Rich Condit, are you listening? Um, <laughs> let me just share the preprint, <laughs> COVID-19 convalescent plasma outpatient therapy to prevent outpatient hospitalization, a meta-analysis of individual participant data from five randomized trials posted on MedRx. They reported a 30% relative risk reduction for all cause hospitalization. So really not much different than molnupiravir, which is just pills to take. Daniel, could you combine molnupiravir and convalescent plasma? You know, you probably could, and you could probably even combine molnupiravir and Paxlovid. Yeah, would that would you get additive protection? So I don't know, and I think again, you know, this is I, you know, and it don't you know, don't try this at home without doing the science. Um, it would be good to do the science and find out, um, you know, can we start adding these things, uh, particularly when you're looking at those high risk patients, right? So you got someone who's, you know, got, mm -hmm. um, you know, a hematological malignancy. They're on chemo. You know, we've lost Ebusheld. Um, you know, maybe they're not responding as well to the vaccines or we wouldn't expect them. You know, do you do just Paxlovid or do you do Paxlovid and Molnupiravir? Do you do Paxlovid and um, convalescent plasma? And actually, that's a good point because I will say a couple things here. The effect size was greatest in those with both early transfusion and high titer, right? So um, not all convalescent plasma is the same. Um, no significant reduction in hospitalization was seen with treatment after five days. So we have a mm -hmm. small, um, small window there. Um, also, no significant reduction if that convalescent um, COVID-19 convalescent plasma had antibody titers below the median titer. So low titer just doesn't do much. Um, and where, where do we stand? Because I know, you know, people have said, oh, you know, convalescent plasma is recommended by the IDSA. Well, let's put a qualification there. Um, Recommendation 19, among patients hospitalized with COVID-19, the IDSA recommends against, strong recommendation. Recommendation 14, among ambulatory patients at high risk for progression to severe disease who have no other treatment options. I'm not sure that actually exists, right? Why would they not get malnupiravir? Um, the IDSA panel suggests um, FDA-qualified high titer convalescent uh, plasma. They say within eight days of symptom onset, we, we know that um, that window is probably smaller. So in the United States, the FDA EUA only authorizes use in patients with immunosuppressive disease or receiving immunosuppressive treatment. Um, patients, particularly those who are not immunocompromised, who place a low value on the uncertain benefits and a high value on avoiding possible adverse events associated with convalescent plasma would reasonably decline convalescent plasma. So not, not very compelling, not a, not a really um, you know, large group of patients that would get targeted here. The article, Bacterial Co-Infection and Empirical Antibiotic Therapy in Patients with COVID-19, published in OFID, retrospective study of 367 adult patients with a high rate of microbiological testing. And they found that the rate of bacterial co-infection in hospitalized patients was not 80%, like we're seeing as far as usage, but confirmed in less than 10%, confirmed in only 8%. Uh, so just, just want to point that out. And by the way, they, they reported that empiric antibiotic use in patients without positive results for microbiological tests was not associated with a benefit. We did not see improved 30-day mortality or improved inpatient mortality. Um, so not helpful and seeing here about a doubling of bacterial co-infection in patients that got those early unnecessary <laughs> antibiotics. So um, you're actually doing harm. You know, I think we've said this several times. You're doing harm if you give antibiotics in the first week for a viral infection when they don't have a bacterial co-infection. 
All right. Um, COVID, early inflammatory, lower respiratory hypoxic phase. I've been asked, we need a code for this so that we know. I think this is a better indicator of what's going on, how many folks are getting hospitalized for COVID with a requirement for supplemental oxygen. Um, steroids at the right time, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, remdesivir, if not on a ventilator. Um, and we'll be discussing in a little more detail next week, tocilizumab now is, is approved, not just EUA, um, but as, actually has the indication for COVID. All right, COVID, the late phase, um, and that's where we're getting in our show here. Mm -hmm. A question we often get is regarding timing of surgery after COVID. The article, Association of Time to Surgery After COVID-19 Infection with Risk of Postoperative Cardiovascular Mortality, published in JAMA Network Open, suggests a reduction in complications once we get to about 100 days out. Uh, really nice figure. These results were obtained from a single center retrospective cohort study conducted among almost 4,000 um, adult patients, previous diagnosis of COVID-19. Primary outcome was the composite occurrence of major cardiovascular comorbidity defined as DVT, pulmonary embolism, cardiovascular accident, myocardial injury, acute kidney injury, and death within 30 days after surgery. So you really see a, a nice drop in the incidence of this composite outcome, just giving it that three months out. Now, this theme seems to be getting reinforced as we get more information. The article, demonstration of stable clusters of symptoms in long COVID, uh, published in OFID. So this group, uh, previously demonstrated distinct phenotypes of long COVID, uh, but the impact of later waves caused by SARS-CoV-2 variants on long COVID presentations. And they, here they present, um, again, sort of recurrent, a three symptom clusters defining long COVID, a musculoskeletal pain symptom cluster, a cardiorespiratory cluster, and a third less symptomatic cluster. Um, different clusters over time um, with characteristics of the cardiorespiratory phenotype evolving over time. Um, I also like the article, Longitudinal Analysis of T-Cells in COVID-19 Survivors with Post-Acute Sequelae of COVID-19 Reveals Association Between Individual Symptoms and Inflammatory Indices, published in OFID. As we discussed above, it is simplistic to think of the immune system as only B cells and antibodies versus T cells. And here, instead, T cells will save us. Um, we see the suggestion that T cells are actually causing trouble. Um, so their investigation demonstrated in this cohort, participants who reported persistent dyspnea, forgetfulness, confusion, and chest pain had significantly higher levels of CD8 positive, Ki67 positive cells. Those with dyspnea also had significantly higher levels of CD8, CD38, CD8 granzyme B positive, and CD8 IL-10 cells. Those who suffered from forgetfulness, chest pain, and joint pain had significantly higher levels of the CD4, CD25 positive cells. So a bit complex to go through all these cell types. So to, again, oversimplify after I, I said we shouldn't do that, these findings suggest an ongoing T cell activation and an increase in T regulatory cells um, in an ongoing attempt to control ongoing host inflammation. And I will close with a shout out for the LISTEN study, the Listen to Immune Symptom and Treatment Experiences Now study. I don't know who comes up with that, but uh, the purpose of this study is to understand long COVID, post-vaccine adverse events, right? So not just long COVID, but folks having issues post-vaccine and the corresponding immune responses by collecting information about symptoms, medical history from participants who are members of a patient community and by collecting blood and saliva samples from some participants. So um, I've got a link here in the show notes. Um, these are our colleagues up at Yale. So Akiko and uh, Harlan Krumholtz. Um, and then as I like to always close, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, I would like folks to pause right here, um, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, click on the donate button. Maybe you can even get your family members listening. Uh, maybe that rich uncle who wants to you know, feel good, the Christmas cheer here. Um, go ahead and donate, every small amount helps. Um, during the rest of this month and all through January, donations to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential maximum donation of $40,000 um, to Microbe TV. Yes, this is the time of year to get your support in for us. It's our big fundraiser. It helps us do our work throughout the year. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Donna writes, 
I hope by the time I have an answer for this, it's a moot point. But for the moment, my son, 17, with asthma, controlled well by a 2X daily inhaler of Redihale, has only had the first two vaccinations in 2021. In late 2021, he became needle phobic while using Dubexent for eczema. He could not do his fourth dose. We've been working with docs and psychologists since then. He's been in intensive therapy for anxiety since February, uh, but it has brought us down this rabbit hole of avoidance behavior, and he has still not received booster shots or a flu shot. We're outside of Boston in a community highly vaccinated. Should he be wearing a mask? Should he mask in certain situations? Yeah, so th this is a, this is challenging, and, and let me sort of, you know, a recap of, um, you know, I'll say what I'm saying, um, you know, we do think the science supports that it is ideal to at least get those those three first shots, right? So that, you know, this is probably not a two-shot vaccine. It's probably a three-shot vaccine. We really don't know how important getting additional shots are in, in different groups, right? So we, we clearly talk about the elderly. Elderly, people with um, multiple medical problems. Um, yeah, we really encourage them to, to get the booster shots based on what we know from the science. Um, you know, you mentioned asthma. Interesting enough, you know, early on, I would have thought asthma was going to be a risk factor for severe disease. Asthmatics actually tend to do fine, which is interesting. Just put that in context. Um, so if, if your son is a lower risk individual, um, you know, how important it is for them to get this bivalent booster if they're needle phobic. I, I'm not sure it's that important. So I think that's something that you can have a discussion with, with, with your provider about, um, you know, should people be wearing masks, uh, during this horrible respiratory, um, season. Um, actually, for your son, I'm a little bit more worried about the other respiratory viruses, human metanumavirus, influenza, things like that. So yeah, I mean, I think that that's reasonable. You're going to have to have a discussion there with, with your son. Um, but if you're in a situation where they're potentially at risk of getting a respiratory virus that was going to trigger an asthma exacerbation, um, certainly it makes sense to do what you can to lower that risk. David writes... Paxlovid is under the tree, a gift from physicians to thee. No nostrum, exotic, or antibiotic. We wish you peace, love, and ID. <laughs> I like Thanks that. Thanks for a great podcast. I always listen. That's from David Clements, MD, from Carolina Internal Medicine. Thank you for the poem. <laughs> Dan writes, um, a friend of mine, female, has been testing antigen positive for three months. She's twice vaccinated, has had COVID twice. Um, has a variety of medical conditions, takes a variety of drugs, has had fibromyalgia for 20 years. My question are, how common is it for someone to be testing positive for so long? Could she still be infectious? Are there clinical consequences? What can she do? The NHS here in the UK is fobbing her off as she mostly feels okay. It's really hard to get an ID specialist unless you're really sick here. My parents can't get Paxlovid. It seems the NHS doesn't give it to elderly elderly or people with severe high-risk mor morbidities, comorbidities. It's very frustrating. So what about this long-term antigen persistence, Daniel? Yeah, so we certainly see this. Um, you know, what what is the percentage? I don't think we have a good number. You know, it's less than 1%. I'll, I'll put it there. But we certainly see people continue to antigen test positive. Um, you know, in general, we, we don't have, um, you know, a suggestion that these people continue to be, you know, typhoid Marys to bring up mm -hmm. one of my distant Irish, uh, you know, ancestors, um, you know, getting a, getting a handle on this, you know, if, if you could actually get a PCR with a CT value that might give you some sense, is this some of the CT value of about 40? Is there just a tiny amount still there? Um, you know, you're measuring antigen with the antigen test. Now I'm telling you to measure nucleic acid with a PCR, but I think that that would be a, a, a reasonable thing to at least get some sense of what's going on here. I don't, I don't know if you need an ID specialist to do that if there's something um, that could just be done otherwise. But do, do I suspect this person is continuing to transmit and spread to others? Um, not from what you're telling me. I got an email today from a, a clinical immunologist in Germany who has patients, uh, children with inborn errors of immunology. And he says they, they are uh, antigen positive for months and months. Yeah. And he says he's trying to get people to do plaque assays but nobody wants to do a plaque assay. They don't want to do PCR. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I know there's some people here in New York that do plaque assays. So I'm trying to hook them up with them because that, that would be, it's a good, that's the experiment to do. 
do a black essay, see if there's any infectious virus there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then also, you know, to follow like, you know, people around this individual, are they turning positive? Uh, that too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That would be very good. Yeah. Household contacts of people who are antigen positive for months. Those are good studies. Yeah. Uh, Eric writes, I was recently prescribed a five day course of prednisone, 40 MIGs for, I'm in my late forties. How would a short course affect your immune response? If I got infected with SARS-CoV-2 or influenza, should I seek antivirals? And for how long of a period after taking steroids? I'm up to date on all my vaccines. Yeah. I mean, a short course, five days like that, um, I, I would have limited concerns. You know, if someone's on steroids when they get infected or they get infected and you put them on steroids, that's when we're seeing the issues. And lastly, from Jenny, I'm on Evusheld and have an upcoming appointment for my next shots. I called my doctor and asked if I should still come in, given it isn't effective for the current variants and has potential adverse effects. He said I should still get it as it still retains efficacy prophylactically. Now I'm just confused. I keep reading it's inactive against the new subvariants. Do you know why he says it's still effective? What am I missing? Um, yeah. So, you know, th this is a challenge and, you know, and, and maybe I'll, I'll relate to what we've been, you know, looking at neutralizing antibodies that, that would suggest that every shell lacks neutralizing antibodies. And this was designed as a neutralizing antibody therapy. So uh, this isn't saying, oh, I've been vaccinated and the rest of my, my orchestra of immune players can come to bear. This is supposed to be a neutralizing antibody. It's been tested. It's not a neutralizing antibody in the current environment. So, um, yeah, I've I've stopped giving folks Evusheld. The EUA is still out there, but you know, as we've learned, until they remove the EUA and actually take all the doses of Evusheld and get them out of the hands of clinicians, they will continue to be used. That's TWIV weekly clinical update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you, and everyone, Merry Christmas and be safe.